quoi. Welcome to The Edge, a program where we spotlight Purdue University faculty, scholars, and innovators, highlight their careers, scientific achievements, and their vision for the future of their scientific field. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And we continue our spotlight on microbiome sciences on The Edge. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Mohit Verma, who's assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering and the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. Welcome to the program, Mohit, and thank you so much for taking time to speak to us today and tell us a little bit about your journey so far. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Tommy, for that introduction, and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I've been at Purdue since 2018 in the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering. Um, a lot of my work, um, of course, builds on my experience in my postdoc and um, PhD. Initially, I did my undergrad and PhD both in nanotechnology engineering at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And during my PhD is where I started looking into um, how can we use different types of biosensors or nanotechnology to detect bacteria? So that was my introduction to microbiology, let's say. Um, then towards my postdoc, I went to Harvard for a couple of years with jo Dr. George Whitesides. That's where I learned more about microbiome and how to think about it in, uh, in, in a different lens, I would say. Um, and we also learned a lot about uh, paper-based devices, how to make things simpler, but still effective. Um, and that's the philosophy that I've brought to my lab here at Purdue, trying to come up with um, simple solutions that can be scaled up and brought out into the field. So you'll hear a little bit about that today. That's awesome. That's that's really good. And I, you know, I did go back and I looked a little bit at your publication record. And your your first publications are like, wow, an introduction into nanotech and nanotechnology, different imaging, contrast agent technology. And I, it seemed like at Waterloo, you really got your feet wet. And uh, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, Frank Gu's lab and what you were able to do there and what you like, what did you learn? Because I mean, it just seems like you exploded with a bunch of great, great publications early on. Yeah, I had a good time um, in the early part of my career. So um, during the undergrad program, we have something called a co-op program at the University of Waterloo in Canada, where what you do is you um, study, let's say, for four months, and then you go out and work for four months or eight months and eight months. And during one of these co-op opportunities, I had the opportunity to work with Professor Frank Gu as an undergrad researcher. And that was my first exposure to research, really. And I was like, I was kind of blown away because you're working on things that no one has really done before trying to discover new things, lots of failure, but then the one time that it works, that's just really exciting, right? So, um, and that was my introduction to like real applications of nanotechnology. So um, I started with drug delivery. So making new types of nanoparticles that could be used for um, chemotherapy. Um, that was my very first project. Um, and again, we we're trying to do conjugate these two polymers that had never been conjugated before so that you can create new types of drugs, that, uh, new types of delivery devices. Um, and of course, now you hear um, they're being used for vaccines and a lot of other drug delivery. So those kinds of particles, that was my introduction. And that led me... Uh, and always I was interested in a variety of different applications. So that's why there was drug delivery. There was gold nanoparticles, which is what my PhD evolved towards um, because they were exciting. They change color at the nanoscale. You can make them red, you can make them blue. Um, you can have applications in biosensors. Um, initially, my advisor was skeptical because he didn't really have that much experience, but it worked. So he was like, oh, this is great. I'm glad you didn't listen to me and went forward anyways. <laughs> so uh, so no, but uh, but working with Professor Frank Gu, he was really, he was an assistant professor just like me um, when he had joined. Um, he came from Bob Langer lab to he had that philosophy uh, of application driven research as well. Um, and he was a really good mentor in the sense of giving you the independence and freedom to um, be self-motivated and self-driven and really have ownership of your project. And that's something that I still kind of imbibe in my students because I really hope that they become motivated and um, driven to do their own projects. Um, so yeah, definitely exciting times. And thanks to the co-op program, because otherwise you don't get as much exposure um, um, yeah, as easily, I would say. 
So, and, and, okay, so did that give you, that that seemed to have exposed you more on the uh, materials engineering side mm-hmm. of, of things, right? And, yeah. uh, but, but the application for drug delivery uh, then got you exposed to the biological side of things. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, there, there's um, two uh, developments there. So our first nanoparticle, it was a polymeric nanoparticle that was developed. Initially, we were targeting cancer, but what we, with our collaborations, what we found was that it could also be used for ocular drug delivery. So just as eye drops, because um, a lot of the problems with uh, current eye drops are that the drug gets washed away too quickly. Um, so it'll just be removed, right? Uh, or if you make it sticky, it can be too itchy if you make the particles too big. So you need to be, it needs to be small so that's not uh, uncomfortable and then if you can make it stick to the mucus then it will stay for much longer so we took our nanoparticles and developed it into that application um, so from that I got exposed to more the host physiology like we were doing animal experiments and those kinds of things um, but then the second came during my PhD when I started looking at gold nanoparticles as a way to detect uh, bacteria and that was also driven by ocular applications because we're looking at how do we detect contamination in contact lenses because uh, eye infections is a problem with contact lenses people don't clean it often enough. So how do you find out whether it's dirty or not? So we figured maybe contact lenses would be a way, uh, sorry, gold nanoparticles would be a way to do it. Um, So that actually, that was my first exposure to microbiology because I didn't know much about microbiology other than like very basics um, and learned on the go. So just during research, learned how to culture bacteria, learned how to do all these things, and then learned how they would interact with gold nanoparticles. And that's basically what my PhD was to develop um, sensors using gold nanoparticles to detect different types of pathogenic bacteria. That's awesome. And so you, it seems like you, you've even brought that now to more of the work that you guys are doing in your lab uh, today. It it seems like it's so diverse. You have such a nice broad group. Uh, And I know that bacterial detection, or let's call it more broadly pathogen detection is a big field that you continue to uh, foster in your lab. Tell us a little bit about that and how, maybe even how these gold nanoparticles have continued to help you in developing some of these diagnostic tools that you uh, you continue to develop. Yeah, for sure. So um, it's interesting because when I got here in 2018 as a new assistant professor, it was pretty much open, right? In terms of what you can work on, you can work on almost anything you want. Um, So um, I was pretty open, looking for opportunities, looking at what we want to work on, um, trying to leverage some of the experiences that I've had. Um, and most recently, during my postdoc, I had a lot of experience on using these biosensors on paper-based devices. So trying to make them more user-friendly, more easy to use, those kinds of things. Um, so during one of these networking meetings, actually, um, organized by the Colleges of Agriculture and Engineering, um, I met um, a beef cattle producer who kind of came up to me and he was like, oh, you know, I only wish there was this uh, solution for this problem where I have these cattle that get sick, but I don't really know what they're sick from. I don't know which antibiotics to give them. Um, and I only wish I knew like something that would guide it. And that was really one of the key moments in um, starting my lab and um, coming up with the project because it was bovine respiratory disease was the problem. Turns out to be almost a billion dollar problem annually in the US. Um, It causes a lot of losses. A lot of people suffer from it. And initially we thought uh, we could use gold nanoparticles to actually do this, Um, but it turns out there's better ways. So we didn't end up using our gold nanoparticles, um, but we found that um, we can use more nucleic acid detection. So that makes it more versatile than the gold would and also more specific and um, reconfigurable for different pathogens. So that's where we, um, dove into nucleic acids and um, developed a lot of uh, tests for bovine respiratory disease. So we can look at bacteria, we can look at viruses, we can look at antibiotic resistance genes. And um, we've also then expanded to other applications outside of bovine respiratory disease, other animals. We looked at COVID-19 during the pandemic. Um, and now we're also looking at some plant health applications. So, so and, and so that's all just from... Uh, this connection with this, uh, you know, cattle producer or cattle farmer, that that is that's awesome. And so it, but it goes beyond detection of 
bacteria. Now you're you're telling me the the this particular nucleic acid detection method you can use to detect different pathogens that might be affecting uh, the cattle. Um, tell us a little bit about about that uh, technology. I you know and and I know it's based on. Uh, a version of polymerase chain reaction, the PCR reaction. But can you tell us a little bit what that what that is and and how you use it? Yes, definitely. So the really cool thing about detecting nucleic acid is that nucleic acids is that you can design assays for a variety of different targets. So we are using a technique called loop mediated isothermal amplification or LAMP for short. Um, and the keyword there is really isothermal. So with PCR, um, what you need is typically um, you need to change the temperature, oscillate between temperatures to get your reaction to happen and get your product. With uh, LAMP, you can do it at a single temperature. And the reason that's important is because then it's simpler equipment that can actually run these assays. So we can make it more portable, we can make it more user-friendly, those kinds of things. Um, it works like most uh, nucleic acid assays work, which is it will detect a sequence of either DNA or RNA, depending on which... Um, primers you provided. Primers are just short uh, chains of nucleic acids. Um, and then one of the advancements that we bring in is trying to put all of this onto paper-based devices. So we put all our reagents on these paper-based devices, which just makes it simpler for the user to use. So they don't have to handle or pipette multiple different liquids. They can just add the sample to the paper and then they can get the result out. So that's really what we bring in and that's how LAMP works. Yeah. And so this paper-based device, uh, how does that work? Is that like is that like a litmus test uh, mm -hmm. and that changes color? You dip the piece of paper. How how does that work? Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's actually a great analogy because um, we are using um, pH change as a final output, which means that you do see a color change if it's a positive reaction and if that pathogen is present. Um, and you can see that visually from your eyes. In our case, it goes from red to yellow. So red is negative and yellow would be positive. Um, and the way it works, the mechanism behind it is, I mentioned LAMP. So during LAMP, it's a polymerization reaction. So you're increasing the uh, size of the nucleic acid as the reaction is going on. Every time you add a base, it produces a proton. That proton then causes a change in the pH and that pH change can be detected by a dye um, with our visual eyes. So that's really how, how it works. Um, the advantage of paper is really that you can store all the regions on there. And then when you add a sample, it can be distributed evenly. And it can also, when you want to scale up these devices, make the manufacturing, um, it makes it easier because you can do it by roll-to-roll -roll fabrication. So that's really some of the advantages um, of using these paper-based devices. That uh, that's awesome, and it's just on paper. It, like literally, is it's paper? Yeah. So uh, actually, when we say paper, um, it paper <laughs> encompasses a lot of different uh, things. So not quite the printing paper that we have, but it is uh, made up of cellulose. We use chromatography paper, and that's mostly because it's uh, one of the cleaner forms of paper, right? So you don't have other contaminants that can mess with the assay, so that the fluid flow is uniform, so that you get more reliable results. But yeah, chromatography paper. So it, it sounds like there's some engineering down oh, there yeah. too, nano nanotechnology yeah. engineering yeah. too. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of these paper-based devices. What's going on in the field? What what's coming up? And and I know like you've been not only working on sensors for cattle diseases, but also for human-based diseases. And maybe you can tell us a little bit how that world is moving, where it's shaping. Yeah, so um, our goal has always been to develop this um, paper-based devices, started with the bovine respiratory disease project. But um, of course, in 2020, the pandemic broke out, right? So the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's when we were in the right place, had some right partners in place to work on the COVID-19 uh, detection diagnostics. Um, so we took our technology and accelerated it so that we can get a prototype um, in hand. So we had some industrial partnerships, um, some funding to, to make that happen. Um, that really helped us take it 
forward. So it would have taken us a few years to get to where we were um, in a year. Um, and that really helped us understand how these paper devices work. So, um, and it also helped us understand what are the needs on the clinical side, because um, you can't, and, and manufacturing side, because you can't just design something fancy and hope that it will um, scale up. So those are some challenges that we learned about early on. Um, and that was quite helpful. Um, and so we looked at a variety of different paper devices. Um, and our goal was really to use a saliva-based test for COVID-19 so that it could be easy to use. Um, and this is right when the pandemic was breaking out. Breaking out so like March, April is when we started working on this. Um, it did take us... Uh, it did take us um, quite far along to get a test running, um, and we were able to test um, inactivated viruses and, and work pretty well. Um, the challenge was to translate it to clinic because that was a big jump in terms of the funds and resources needed, and that's where uh, we kind of handed it off so that um, other people can try to um, take that forward. We brought it back to our lab so that we can now take all the lessons that we learned from there and apply it to different applications. So we've taken it, um, continued working on bovine respiratory disease, looking at African swine fever, which is in pigs. Um, it's not in the U.S. yet, but if it ever gets here, it could be a huge issue. So just being prepared and it can also be helpful internationally. Um, we're looking at plant health. Um, we're looking at food safety applications. So contamination of food products, can we detect that more in the field, more more quickly, those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we're taking it. My gosh, it, it seems like it's such a broad field eh? that uh, it's open in, in terms of for for these types of infectious diseases. Do you think because it is an amplification based technology, uh, do you think we would be able to start making it in a way to detect? Protect other human diseases, cancers, and other you know chronic diseases versus infectious diseases. Yeah. Um, so I think it depends on the target. So the way at least LAMP works is it can detect specific genes and it can detect uh, specific targets. So if we have a target that we want, that we can look for, then yes, it can actually apply to a variety of different uh, applications in humans. Um, if it is just a single um, base pair mutation or something like that, that becomes a little bit more challenging using LAMP. There are other techniques which could work and um, um, that's a possibility. But um, using LAMP, there can be a few challenges. So I think it depends on which target is available. And the field is um, moving in uh, the direction of trying to make them more commercially available. So um, paper, of course, paper devices have been around for a while, but one of the challenges has really been how do we scale it up? How do we make it reliable? And how do we detect, let's say, multiple targets at the same time, those kinds of things. So that's still kind of going on. And then one of the challenges is um, just comparing the different approaches because everyone uses different standards um, and it becomes pretty challenging to even compare um, which one works uh, well. So one of my students did a review article just recently where we looked at what is the status of paper-based um, sensors for detection of pathogens. And there, that's what we found. Like, you know, it's really hard to compare the different approaches because people report different things. Um, so some standardization would help a little bit. And it also just being open about um, what are the limitations of your technology and how, how do you think that, that can be improved? So some of those things will help. Um, um, with the translation, especially, but um, definitely a lot of uh, applications, as long as the target is there. Um, for things like mutations, there are other approaches that can be used, um, so that are more sensitive to uh, single base pair mutations. Uh, some of the um, CRISPR Cas types of approaches, system biology approaches, are um, more appropriate for those applications. And so is that a natural evolution of where this could go? I, and in my mind, I'm I'm currently in uh, the pediatrics medical devices mm -hmm. world, and I'm thinking, my gosh, a saliva-based pediatric medical device mm -hmm. would be great to detect malnutrition, to, de to detect diabetes, to detect all kinds of things that are so always and frequently diagnosed 
very late in the development of the child in kindergarten sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if we could detect things earlier in the baby uh, or, you know, the, the, the newborn baby would be, would be great. Um, I, that's where I'm thinking. So if you're, you know, can, could we get your saliva based approaches now to also help us to, you know, do things in in pediatric population, for example. Yeah, very much so. So um, I think it's a more basic um, clinical science question, right? Like, what are the biomarkers to look for? Um, if there's appropriate biomarkers, for sure. Um, and um, another example is, I mean, especially with the early life, um, the microbiome can be quite important in terms of how it evolves and so on, right? Um, so looking for markers in the microbiome that lead to healthy development, that's that's one option, for example. Um, Saliva-based tests, uh, if there's biomarkers there, that's another option. Um, but uh, for sure, like finding it out early has always been the goal, right? Like how early can we go? Um, and in this development, um, because it is non-invasive, it would definitely be um, suitable. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, the 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 mouth microbiome, the saliva, saliva buccal microbiome, as well as potential, you know, RNA that is floating around in the saliva yeah. as well that yeah. could tell you what is going on so interesting and and su such a such a neat approach to the question and to create a diagnostic that um that that you're taking it seems to me like your background in the nanoparticles uh, and your thinking as an engineering and approaching some of these medical problems helps is that do you find that that's the case i mean when you when you're talking to other microbiome scientists most of them are biologists they're not engineers like you right yeah so um i think that's why we take a different approach than maybe other uh, colleagues do um, and we often, so one of the things I try to do is um, start with a problem. And that's what I've learned after coming to Purdue, especially, is make sure there is a defined problem that we're trying to address. And that's what excites me as an engineer, solving difficult problems or complex problems, right? And actually making it happen. So um, definitely when we start with problems, um, we try to then come up with what is the simplest solution for this that would still be effective, right? Um, and of course we have, like we treat all of the technology that we have as tools and whatever is the most appropriate tool is what we try to use. Um, often in engineering, it, it is a common fallacy that people will just develop a fancy tool and then try to find the solution. We try to avoid that, although we might have done that sometimes, but we try to avoid that. So um, starting with a problem definitely helps. And I think that's been part of my training, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think it's it's a reflection also of your publications, which are so exciting too. And they they're uh, they're combining so many uh different disciplines and it's it's great. I I see that you you continue to be also active in this area of uh soft robotics. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so what we're doing, um, soft robotics is another thing that I learned during my postdoctoral um, research fellowship with Dr. George Whiteside. Um, he's one of the pioneers in the field. And it's a very interesting field because um, what it um, is looking at is, of course, everyone's familiar with robots, but um, instead of using plastic or metal to make these robots, can we use these elastic materials so that um, these robots will be safer to use around humans, around animals, or around delicate objects or undefined object shapes. So that's really the foundation of the field. And there's been a um, boom in the last um, 10, 20 years, uh, a few companies out there now as well. Um, and my interest has been more um, targeted towards combining some of the techniques and methods that we use in soft robotics um, with some of these biological uh, questions or biological um, problems. So for example, um, we are looking at how do we use these soft materials to 
uh, mimic systems like cut on a chip type of systems, but try to make them more high throughput and try to um, make them more controllable um, so that we can do some of these studies um, in vitro that uh, some of these microbiome studies in vitro instead of trying to do in vivo or getting uh, human samples because you have a lot more control. So that's that's how we've been thinking about it. Um, that's something that's kind of under development um, in the lab. Um, we can look at um, gut microbiome. We can also look at the respiratory microbiome, which has been a big thing because of all of our diagnostic work. It's focused on respiratory microbiome. So model systems to study microbiome host interactions. You can build those kinds of systems using the tools from self robots. That's awesome. And so I love the combination too. Um, and it sounds like you're a kid in a playground at Purdue because you can really tap into so many of the different, different resources and collaborators, modalities. Uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. I know you started by saying that when you got to Purdue, you pretty much had a blank slate, uh, but you have been making good use of that slate for sure. Yeah, definitely. And um, that's something that even during my interview, when I was interviewing at Purdue, I noticed, which is that it is a very open environment, very open to collaborations across departments, colleges, across the campus. Um, and when I got here in 2018, um, the first year, that's kind of what I did. Um, I just went to a lot of these seminars, talked to a lot of people, um, just learned about uh, different possibilities and then started working with them on grant proposals or review articles or ideas. Um, and that um, helped set some specific goals, right? Because, of course, uh, collaboration, collaborative science is is thrown around a lot, but like unless you have a specific goals, it's hard to actually make progress. So what I found was having some deadlines saying, OK, this is what we're trying to do really helps um, get the team together. Um, and that worked like we, we got a lot of uh, ideas through the ones that were successful. We got projects going on. Um, and then from those projects, we were able to um, get introduced to other people who are like, oh, yeah, you know, I also have this problem, which this technology could use. And then we work to develop teams that way. Um, and Purdue has been a really nice place to just work across campus because most people are open. They're like, yeah, this sounds cool. Let's let's talk about it. Um, so most people have been very open to to work on these exciting problems. And that's yeah, that's been exciting. And, and you say that very nonchalantly, uh, but I do know that you balance a lot of these collaborations. And not only do you balance these collaborations, but you also have industry collaborations as well. Um, how, how do you do that, Mohit? Because I, I think for a lot of people that might be watching this program or listening to it, the life of a prof is mystical to some people, uh, and you're you're telling us a lot uh, about the collaboration piece. But there's also this industry collaborations that I know you you very much uh, participate in, and and how you balance them both is an art form. So I would yeah. love if you could <laughs> share some of that. It's funny that you mentioned the life of a professor being mystical because I have a blog by that exact name called lifeofaprofessor.com. And that's where <laughs> I try to remove some of this mysticism and talk about some of these things that happen in the background. Um, so, um, uh, and some of the articles are on there. But um, yeah, great question about like academia versus industry versus entrepreneurship, which I'll throw in there as well. Um, so um, generally, my philosophy has been uh, about half the work we do is pretty much like we're the lead, this is our expertise, and this is what we do. The other half is very collaborative. And um, what that helps us do is have both depth and breadth. Um, so we are experts at certain things, but then we also tackle problems that are important. And that's where really the breadth comes from, or work with people who have really exciting technologies, like either of those, right? Um and that automatically brings us to both academia and industry. So um, there's a lot of industry-sponsored project, and oftentimes they will have the problems, right? They're like, okay, this is a really important problem that we could use help with. Um, and then we think about which technologies are appropriate, and then we work with them. Um, so in that sense, that's kind of how we end up um, working in, in both spaces. Um, we get funding from both sources, federal um, as well as industry. 
Um, and I find it very helpful to um, have those problems uh, because real life problems, um, it's helpful to actually some of these uh, partners have um, helped uh, have invited me to go see a farm like what does the lettuce farm look like in commercial production right and you'll see like acres and acres of lettuce and you're like yeah, how are we going to detect like one leaf or one bacterium in this thing so yeah you start thinking like more logically and more practically like what are the solutions that will actually work right so these connections help um, help frame things. Um, the other side of his things is entrepreneurship that I'll mention as well. Um, I have a startup and as I mentioned, my goal has always been to solve problems, but also see that they are applied and someone is using the technology that we developed in our lab. Um, and that's that's the reason for the startup. Um, both my PhD and postdoc labs have had that culture. So that was easy for me to pick up. Um, it wasn't um, a hurdle or anything. Um, but from the startup now, we are trying to take the technology developed in my lab and turn them into products really so that people can use it. Um, mostly biosensor focused on animal health, agriculture, those kinds of applications, but that's where we are. And it's going pretty well. Purdue has a nice ecosystem to support that through um, Purdue Research Foundation, which is changing to Purdue Innovates uh, soon. And uh, they've really been helpful to get us up and running because finding the right partners, um, I don't want to do it all and I can't. So finding the right partners to actually do the business side of things has been very helpful. So, yeah. So at Purdue, you have uh, a lot of support from both sides so that you can stay focused on your science and continue to you know, develop the breadth of it. Yeah, exactly. So um, definitely on, um, and I think even from our incentives um, in terms of promotion tenure, that's been changing as well. So people have been um, paying attention to these entrepreneurship efforts and how that is actually impactful, right? Not just, um, not just publications because, you know, publications go so far, but you want to actually um, make a difference as well. So um, it's nice that, um, for example, Purdue University has been, valuing that and then PRF has been supporting and providing resources to enable that. And the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering just sounds like such a great fit for what you do. I mean, from diagnostics in cattle and veggies, uh, right? Like produce, yeah. uh, so food security, food safety, yeah. but also on the medical side to SARS-CoV-2 detection. Yeah. Um, and you're able to also uh, develop this entrepreneurial side of you that that you kind of got a little bit from your postdoc lab and you've carried on here. Uh, that how do you how do you pick what students uh, to to take on? How do you? How do you define what collaborators you want to work with? And I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions in there, but maybe we start, let's start with the students. What what would that, you know, if, if there was a student that was thinking, oh my, I, I think I want to do what Dr. Verma does, what what should, how they should they prepare and what type of students would, would you want in your lab? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Great question. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned ag and biological engineering because um, before I got to Purdue, I didn't really know much about it. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know what this is. Uh, but once I got here, I learned about all the opportunities. Um, so it's it's a really, really cool department in that sense. Um, it falls in both colleges. So it's in College of Agriculture and College of Engineering. And once I got here, it, that's when I started realizing um, kind of all the problems that uh, are in agriculture that could be ad addressed using engineering tools. And that was really how all of these projects came into being uh, because of the ecosystem that uh, that I'm in. Um, so um, when we try to look at projects, we try to do all the way from developing a really new fancy assay to going out and testing in the field. And when I look for students, um, it's kind of anywhere in that um, ecosystem. So we have students that are um, ag and bio ABE students, um, biomedical engineering students, but we have had people with different backgrounds. So we've had people from um, industrial engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, um, electrical and computer engineering. So um, biochemistry, all, all kinds of all kinds of places. Um, and really it's, um, it's it's it has to align with the interests of whatever project we're looking at. Um, so the student needs to be interested in that. That's 
the one of the main things and then motivation so you know as i mentioned one of the things i try to do is students um to get them to be self-driven right so you have to be excited about the project so that you can actually work on it research is not easy you're working on something that has not been done so there will be a lot of failure for sure um but it's those few times that things work that's what really drives people usually um so we get a variety of students and um we do uh, because we do a variety of things, um, we've had this lab culture where people can learn from each other as well, and um, that helps. Um, for example, we have computer science students who can learn how to speak to biologists or speak to some of this biology uh, terminology. We have mechanical engineering students who can learn about the biochemistry and then um, think about how to design devices around it. So all kinds of things that happen in the lab, and that's um, that's that's how we want to have it. So yeah. And and I I I just want to you know bring you back to your gut on a chip, which you mentioned so fast that I don't know if anybody caught it, but these students that you're talking about, like they have to put together a microfluidic device with cells that mimic the gut. And then you're going to start asking questions about them and how do they work and what if you expose them to this or that. And so it the, the mechanical engineer has to make sure the forces and the pressures and the dynamic flow of things and but, but like... It's so it must be a rich environment where they are totally just uh, feeding off each other. No, it, yeah, it, it's, exactly. it yeah. sounds very exciting to me. Was it was it like that in Goo's lab? Was it like that at Harvard at Whitehead's lab? So in um, Dr. Goo's lab uh, at Waterloo, um, we were mostly nanotechnology engineers, but I think because we're nanotechnology engineers, we already are exposed to all kinds of things, uh, uh, including chemistry, chemical engineering, electrical engineering as well. Um, so we already kind of come with that background um, in the white test lab for sure, because we had engineers, we had scientists, chemists, uh, biologists all over the place, um, a lot of postdocs. And so therefore there was a diverse um, the first set of um, people. And that also helped me personally develop that language, right? Like how do you actually talk across these um, different uh, disciplines? Um, and that helped when I, over here, when I started to uh, establish collaborations. So that was definitely helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That, awesome. Awesome. And, and what, a, again, what a place to be at so that that convergence of disciplines comes together and, and it facilitates it for you too. <laughs> Um, Mohit, I know that you have also been active in, in collaborations that are looking at the colon microbiome through targeted sampling and using a smart capsule type approach. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how your lab has been able to use uh, this information or develop this information uh, in, in this collaboration? Yeah, definitely. And um, that is one of the industry um, collaborations. Um, so through the Lily, uh, Isla Lily and company, um, which is a strong partner with Purdue on a lot of research projects. And um, I work uh, with Dr. Rahim Rahimi from Materials Engineering on, on those aspects. And there, um, really, all, a lot of the device development happens in Rahim's lab. And uh, we help more on the microbiome characterization as well as the metabolomics characterization and trying to figure out um, how to how to probe things that haven't been probed yet, right? So just like with the sensors work, we try to see how can we do some of this analysis in situ. Um, it's the same kind of principle here. How can we do some of this analysis uh, from places that are not accessible? So if you look at microbiome in general, people look at fecal samples, right? And that's typically what everyone analyzes for gut microbiome. Um, but with this capsule, the idea is you take this capsule in, it will open either in the small intestine or in the large intestine, collect some of the sample, and then once it's out, you can open up the capsule and then get the sample from that spot in, an, in a non-invasive manner. Um, so that's really the principle. And then it can be applied to a variety of different things. Um, 
right now we're looking at where that can be used to um, better understand how inflammatory bowel disease works. So IBD, ulcerative colitis, as well as uh, Crohn's disease and see maybe can there be more targeted therapy or are there microbiome effects? Um, so it, it can be applied to a lot of different things. Um, but because it's uh, kind of agnostic to what disease we're looking at, it, it can be applied to other diseases as well. Yeah, no, and that again, I I like the versatility and your openness to say, well, we can tackle a lot of different things with one particular tool. And it seems like this is a way to start um, with minimal invasiveness, right? To be able to sample uh, the gut microbiome at these different locations. Um where do we go from here? I mean, I, I know we're doing a lot of the basic work to understand uh, the different diseases, right? Uh, what if we do detect the different bacterial populations are skewed? Or mm -hmm. what if we do see, are we now then trying also to find ways of, of restoring the balance of bacterial populations? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work on the probiotic side of things, but it's generally been very challenging, especially in adults, to get any kind of shifts, right? Um, fecal transplant is the most successful, it works in a specific case with C. difficile infection, um, but in a lot of other applications, doesn't quite work. So it is it is the challenging thing, like what do we do with this, inter uh, with this knowledge and what is the best intervention? Um, so... Early on, I think what will happen is um, some of this information might help guide um, some of this information might help guide what kind of interventions might be useful or how to administer the intervention. So, for example, um, there there could be patients that are um, responsive to a drug or not responsive, depending on the microbiome composition, right? And uh, if we're able to get that information in, maybe we uh, change the dosage of the drug, or maybe we try a different drug because it's being metabolized or something like that. So I think some of that information can come from technologies like the the one we're creating. That's probably more likely to be successful early on rather than just changing the microbiome altogether. The one part where it does work, uh, the microbiome changing, is actually early health, where early... Um, where the microbiome is not yet established very well, you can still have the right um, bacteria in place that helps long-term development. Now, we are not quite targeting that because this capsule is still, I mean, it is geared for adults. Um, I don't know how it works in children and all that, but at least from the intervention point of view, that's where things are looking pretty good. Uh, uh, they could be pretty successful. Okay. And, and um, so, so it, it's got, it's got still runway to go in, in, in preclinical, but you see that it, it could potentially take us there. Yeah. 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 Um, what is it about, and the, you, you touch on so many different areas. I've been wanting to ask you, you know, what is it about the field or you know we can talk about nanotechnology uh, something that you may want to say about that but what is it about this field in particular let's say uh, diagnostics microbiome bacterial detection what you know disease detection what is it about this field that you might want to debunk? Well, what are some of the questions that you say, well, you know, this doesn't make sense and I would really like to make a difference here? Well, um, I think with the microbiome field, um, one of the things has been that, you know, it was almost overhyped, which is, you know, it can cure everything. It's a cure for everything because people are finding that it's associated with all kinds of diseases. So there's a lot of literature and even maybe startups that are like, like oh yeah, take this magic pill and, and it will work out. Um, so it's just not as not that simple. So it works in very specific cases and it works very well, um, but we don't have that kind of information or knowledge in terms of saying, okay, yes, this is what you need to do to get this outcome um, because it's so complex. And there's always, there's been a lot of um, correlations, but um, the causation has still been missing. Um, that's some of the things that even we're trying to do with the tools we develop. Um, and 
getting good interventions um, it needs like the right um, evidence, right? And that's often missing with this. So that's what I would say is the is the biggest thing there. Okay, uh, and uh, fair enough. I think that yeah. that's good. As an engineer, though, do we get close uh, in coming up with certain solutions, even though it is complex? Do you think we we're developing tools that will allow us to do that? Yeah, I think um, because uh, the field has generally been more cataloging, right? So just looking at what's there and how is it changing? That's probably why it's been like um, too broad and um, just too overpromised. But now because the, I would say the analytical tools are getting better, the methods of analysis are getting better, the model systems are getting better, we can actually, we're actually going towards, okay, this is what causes these changes. We're getting some mechanistic understanding into how these things happen. That will bring us to real interventions that will actually make a difference. So definitely, I think uh, the science is improving, the tools are improving, and that should lead us to better interventions for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, you know, we can, we can probably talk all day about the tools that are helping this field really in a dramatic way sequencing being one of them but i know that you know there is also a big push towards computational tools machine learning techniques that will allow us to start making more sense of these dynamic changes let's say whether them being uh, you know, metabolic changes and, and microbiome changes. Um, what are some of your favorites? And I mean, you're really developing some tools that are, are really, uh, are really like out there and at the edge of the technology development. So, you know, I, I, I I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, so I teach a graduate level course that I've developed called Models and Microbiomes. And we actually touch on um, what is going on, what's exciting. And I, I call it Models and Microbiomes because it includes computational models, um, physical models, and then biological models, right? So we try to cover the breadth of all of those things. And it also keeps me up to date in terms of what's going on. Um, so in in each of those aspects of the computational models, um, really, I think there's there's two sides of this. Um, one is just getting more fundamental understanding on, yes, uh, sequencing, of course, but then what does that mean, right? What do these genes mean? How do they contribute to uh, maybe the metabolic flux and some of those things? So um, the genome-wide models that are being developed for uh, metabol metabolomics data analysis kind of thing, that's really exciting because then um, you can actually go from sequences to predicting what might happen. Um, now they're also being built um, into agent-based models so that you can be like, okay, these are the different microbes and then you can treat the environment as an agent as well and then actually build towards the whole microbiome, right? Trying to get some of that prediction going. Um, so those tools are up and coming. Um, of course, machine learning and AI then is advancing quite rapidly. And you see uh, examples in the popular media as well and just in public with chat GPT and these kinds of things. Um, so that will really, I think, take it forward. Um, but I think it's still important to have this underlying understanding pretty well. Um, and then you can use it to train uh, some of the uh, black box models so that we can actually have applications in place. So it's, it's gonna be a combination of the two. Um, and there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, the data quality and making sure that everything is accessible very easily and machine readable, um, we, we're still missing a lot of standardization in that field. So I think that that can still be improved. Um, and that applies broadly to microbiome, microbial ecology fields. I was just at a conference last year at the for the International Society for Microbial Ecology. And that was one of the topics. It's like, you know, um, for example, for protein folding, they can now use the sequence data to predict the fold. Why, why can't we do that for a microbiome? Um, it's because we don't have the standardization or standard ways of collecting data and, and, and reaching missions. So that's maybe one of the things that will happen in the future. You know, once it's more standardized, more easy to compare data, we will actually be able to predict things uh, in silico that we can't do yet. Yeah, I, and and so great that uh, you're teaching a course in this. I might want to drop into that course every once in a while because it sounds really exciting, and that you're using it also to 
to keep yourself up to date with with what's happening um i think it's it's extremely um uh, exciting to know that this is really brewing up and i i think the both the computational side and as you said the type of data and how to collect that data is just as important as the data itself when to collect it what what's the method so that you can compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges is there a lot of um biostatistics that is also incorporated into these models is that is that also an element here that that you know people are consternating about yeah definitely like um because you have such large amounts of data oftentimes um it's challenging to do the analysis as well right so um for example on one of the brd projects uh, with my collaborator dr timothy johnson um, we've collected a lot of um, microbiome sequencing as well as qpcr data but analyzing that to actually have some outcome and making sense of all of it is challenging so with the help of purdue resources now the data science consulting services, we're looking at, okay, how do we tackle this, right? Um, what are some things that tell us which variables we should look at, which ones should we drop, which is what is just random versus what's not. Um, so for sure, I think um, some of the statistics need to happen before maybe you feed it into uh, machine learning models or AI models. Um, so that's that's being developed. And I still don't think there's like standardized ways of doing it because everyone proposes um, something or the other. Um, there's still probably room in better communication between biostatistics people and people like who are actually collecting data. Um, uh, so that can be better for sure. Yeah, but that's and, ongoing. And you think some of these techniques are the ones that led to the publication with uh, humans and dogs during the COVID uh, pandemic. I mean, tell us a little bit about what what led to that. And I can imagine you're creating this diagnostic. You can put it to good use for that type of question. Yeah, so um, we recently published a review paper looking at the role of dogs in the COVID-19 pandemic pretty broadly. Um, and it was uh, driven by actually one of my postdocs um, who has joined our lab and he has a veterinary background um, and um, he's looked at COVID-19 before joining here. And of course, our lab does a lot of COVID-19 work. And um, it was a timely publication because people were getting interested in, oh, should I be worried about my pet uh, infecting me or, or infecting my pet? Um, and so that was one of the questions we were looking at, like, are dogs really susceptible? And what we were finding is Early on in the pandemic, really not, they were not susceptible um, and they weren't getting any symptoms either. Um, there were very rare cases that maybe some were testing positive. Later on with modified strains, it becomes a little bit more questionable. So it could be that they are getting uh, testing positive, but maybe asymptomatic, um, whether they can transmit it back to uh, the owners is still unclear. Um, so that was one of the findings, um, and a key thing, and, and I think it was pretty timely. We also found a little bit more about the benefits of having pets, and and um, that was very helpful, as you've probably seen um, during the pandemic. Um, and also, as diagnostic devices, like dogs can also sniff out um, COVID patients, which can be used uh, very, for very rapid screening at airports or ports of entry. Um, so that was uh, pretty convincing um, data as well. Um, so that's really what we're looking at uh, pretty broadly, the role of dogs and um, who should be concerned, who shouldn't be concerned um, in, in these cases. So. so so neat, so neat. And now my question would be, are there certain uh, pedigrees, are there certain, uh, you know, uh, yeah. types of dogs that are more susceptible, less susceptible? And then yeah, so good questions. And uh, we've been thinking now uh, broadly about that, which is uh, not specifically to dogs, but just animals, right? Because of what's happened with white-tailed deer and one third of the population in the U.S. being SARS-CoV-2 positive um, and animals as reservoirs, we've been thinking about, okay, which other animals might be um might be susceptible or could be reservoirs. Um, and USDA is interested in that question from the APHIS perspective, so Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services. Um, they had a call about a proposal recently, earlier this year. Um, so I think there's some interest in finding out what's happening with SARS-CoV-2 to begin with, but then also later on just understanding 
um, what's happening in these different animals. How do zoonotic um, pathogens go from one place to another? How does reverse zoonosis happen? And what kind of reservoir organisms might play a role? So that's, I think, um, up and coming field, I would say we're interested in it. I think other people will definitely become more and more interested when thinking about how to prevent the next pandemic, those kinds of questions. So yeah. yeah. And and I think with your technology too, some of the scares that we've had in the past few months uh with uh the avian flu and our turkey and poultry population, I mean, I, I would think that people would be knocking on your door asking, hey, can we develop one sensor for this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so incredible because again, like these operations are huge, right? Like you're, we, you, I, I, going back to what you said is like, okay, we have a field with 10,000 head of lettuce, like, how are you going to detect one thing and the same trouble or the same challenge with the animal population and the agriculture uh, uh, farming uh, practices and the ways that we can that we can monitor these things. So, you know, paper devices and 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 the work that you guys are doing uh, seems to be maybe the more approachable way to start dealing with uh, food safety, food security problem. It, it seems to be at least what you're teaching me today, Mohit. Yeah, definitely. Um, some of these devices, um, definitely because of their scalability, they can be pretty applicable. Um, a lot of times you there, there's another aspect, which is just early detection. So we're also starting to look at other types of sensors that can be um, more like live monitoring or early warning signs. Um, so we're starting to look at those things as well. Um, you wouldn't see that in publications yet because it's just ongoing projects. Um, we got some internal funding, which I think was published um, through Purdue to start looking at that. Can we monitor animals um, uh, such that it will notify you automatically if there's an issue? And then we can come up with our sensors and then be like more specifically, what is the issue? Those kinds of things. So that's something that we're just starting to get into. So maybe in the next couple of years, you'll, you'll see more of that. But um, yeah. That's awesome. I hope we can catch up with you and hear that exciting news. Uh, and I have some ideas of people that I might want to connect you with. <laughs> um, I, again, I think, you know, the the excitement of the breadth, for me, the excitement of the breadth of different areas that your technology and your expertise it, it, coming from an engineering side and an engineering side for nanoparticle, really nanoparticle materials engineering and all the way up. And it seems like now bringing in some of the computational piece as well and this whole genetic approach with your uh, loop mediated isothermal amplification method. I mean, it seems like you've been able to combine things and move forward. I love the soft robot piece also for the uh, gut on a chip uh, approach. And that, that again, seems like really on the edge of, of technology. And um, maybe if you want to leave us with, with a few words, uh, I, I guess, you know, you've, you've mentioned two people that have been quite influential in your life. Is there anybody else that you would want to mention? And maybe some of these last parting words of the technologies that you're developing? Yeah, no, I mean, um, several mentors throughout my career. So, of course, my PhD and postdoc advisors, uh, Dr. Frank Gu and Dr. George Whitesides, but also people around. So, for example, all the ocular work was Dr. Lyndon Jones. He's the one who told us that these are the problems, right? Um, with um, in George Whitesides' lab, uh, Dr. Ramnik Xavier, he's the one who told us these are the microbiome problems to look at. Dr. Thaddy Stappenbeck actually worked on a lot of the... Um, clinical samples and getting those cells. So um, it is it is an ecosystem and um, the importance of networking, um, I think often when I was younger, I understood estimated, but now I'm starting to realize the significance of that and knowing people um, and just getting to, it is, it is driven by people. So even research, hard science is still driven by people. So getting to know people um, and uh, seeing who you work well with, I think that's, that's what 
keeps you going and keeps uh, coming up with good ideas, basically. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and thank you so much for, you know, opening up uh, some of the, uh, the, the knowledge and the technology that you are working with. Uh, Dr. Mohit Verma, Assistant Professor of the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering and the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering, Engineering as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Verma, and have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you, Tommy, for having me. It was a pleasure for this nice chat. Absolutely. Take care.